Well, good morning. I'm going to just walk around here for a second. Um, it is so good to see you this morning. Um, I just um, I just want you to know that I, I, I really like that. That's nice. Uh, we were just saying a little bit ago that you remind me of how my mother dresses because I, 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 I just... I just, she loves the, the leopard print um, because she has this beautiful, beautiful leopard print um, purse. I am so glad that you're sitting there. You're just an inspiration that you're sitting there. Always an inspiration that you're sitting there. I, I just want you to know, thank you so much for sitting there. Um, yeah. Um, you, on the other hand. Um, <laughs> I just thank you. and and thank you so much for 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 being here today. It is it was always nice for you to be here. It is thank you so much. Uh, it is I'm just glad you're here. And and Ellen, I want you to know, always a privilege. I love your hats. I love your hats. Your it's always interesting what hats you have. Every hat that she has goes with something. And uh, we can almost pick out what hat she's got. They're beautiful. Thank you so much for what hat that you wear. Barbara, uh, <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you so much. And Shelby, thank you so much for being here. You're, that's really nice. I, I'm glad what you picked out today. That's very very nice. You did your hair nice today, and uh, she's giving me a look like you're actually giving me a compliment. What, what's up with that? She's like, hmm. um, wow. And what's up with that? Uh, you guys look great. Thank you for sitting up. You sounded great this morning. Didn't they sound great this morning? Yeah. Wow. Um, not that you don't normally sound great, but you, you sounded great. Jonathan, um, now I, I want you to, I want to just say there's, there's more than one point to all this. Barbara, how did that make you feel that I just... How was that? What did you say, Barbara? I said, I didn't care. She just says she didn't care. Uh, uh, Barbara says she didn't care. Um, oh, I'm scared to do this. Um, Bob, how did you feel that you were ignored? Well, come for you. I loved it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. By the way, Jonathan. I am glad you're here, and uh, there's a reason behind this. We have been looking at a, a series. We've been looking at uh, the book of James. The book of James, if you would turn there, you'll understand why. We are looking at a series called Real Christianity. If you were to go back and look at the book of James, just sum it up all at once, you would see that it is called Real Christianity. Pretty easy to, way to look at it. James is writing to Christians, for the most part. There are, I'm sure there are others that are scattered in. But he is writing to a, a bunch of Christians who because of some persecution that was going on during the time of, uh, in, in Jerusalem, they scattered. They didn't have a choice. They had to scatter out. They were called the dispersion. If you remember, we talked about that before. And so he's writing these letters, or this letter, these words, to the dispersion. And as he's writing these, this letter to the dispersion, He's trying to give them this encouragement, these words saying, hey, you know, you've got to keep focused. You've got to remember what this is all about. 
We kind of stayed with chapter 1 last week. We're going to look at parts of chapter 2 this week. And as we look at chapter 2, there is a focus that is so important. It's called favoritism. Favoritism. It's a problem that happens even in our society today. It's a problem that was happening in the churches. By the way, I'm talking about many churches that was already going on in that day, in the day of the early churches in James' time. And so we're going to look at that for just a moment. So look at James chapter 2. Verse 1. And he's basically beginning with this verse 1 saying, Don't pick and choose who should be honored. Now, I, as we go and look at these verses, I think you need to see what's being set up here. I, for us, we come into this sanctuary to have worship. We go to our Sunday school. Again, I encourage you to be a part of that. Or we have adult Sunday school. We have children's Sunday school. We have youth Sunday school. But in, we have meetings. We have fellowship time like we're going to have for our, sun, uh, for our Thanksgiving time. Looking forward to that fellowship and worship. We have different things that go on throughout the week. These are meetings that happen that are just great times, great times of encouragement, great times of learning. But one of their primary times for these churches were to happen, especially in homes or there's meeting groups. And as they do that, they're trying to find ways to grow in their numbers at that time. Just like, quite frankly, one of our focus is to grow in our numbers as well, because we want to give God's word and see people changed. And as they're doing the same thing, listen to these words. Again, chapter 2, verse 1 of the book of James. My brothers, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in, a in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. Stop there for just a second. He says, do not show favoritism. Favoritism. This particular word, favoritism, was originally translated respect of persons using usually the outward. Another word to, for, for translating this word for favoritism, partiality. In other words, some of us in here have partiality to certain kinds of music. Some of you like southern gospel music. Some of you like rock music. And there's even different kinds of rock music, just like there's different kinds of gospel music. Some of you like uh, country western music. Got to make sure I say that right. Did I say it right? Uh, maybe not. There are different kinds of music, and you're, you show partiality to that music. You prefer that kind of music. Some of you show partiality to a, an actor or an actress. We just had a, um, an election. Some of you may have partiality over a candidate, one candidate or the other. Um, I was a little frustrated because my candidate didn't win. I mean, I wrote in Mike Bell for president, but it shot it back out. I don't, Mike, what happened? I, I can't, they told me it was not the right election. I, I don't get it. Sorry, man. I tried. And it goes on to say, do not show favoritism, partiality, as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ. This word faith is sometimes confusing, but I want to give a clarity to the word faith. 
we can't even get past this first sentence until we understand what it truly means. If we can't get past the first sentence, then the rest of it doesn't really make sense. So bear with me. The word faith here really means a reliance on God for salvation. A reliance for God for salvation. So when we look at this particular verse, it says, My brothers, do not show partiality or favoritism as you hold on to this reliance for God for salvation in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And basically, if that's confusing, I love this, if that's confusing, James gives some examples. Let's look, listen to this. He says in verse 2, For example, a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor man dressed in dirty clothes also comes in. If you look with favor on the man wearing the fine clothes and says, sit over here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor man, stand over there or sit here on the floor by my footstool, haven't you discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Hmm. It's kind of interesting that even here in the earliest part of the church development that there is a discrimination that's happening. Now, we don't know exactly how early on this was happening in the church, but apparently this is a problem. And just in case, just in case there is a confusion of what's going on here, he provides the example. And the examples are this. You put the rich guy at the head of the table and put the poor guy in the corner on the floor. Huh. See, that's what's happening at this, in many of these churches in the time of James. They're more focused on the rich guy than the poor guy. Now, this is totally not, totally not what was of approval by Jesus. Real quickly, turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Get your Bibles going here, your electronic devices, your iPads, your iPhones, your i whatever, I don't knows, your I'm looking for it. Okay, Luke chapter six, verse twenty. Jesus says this. It says. Then looking at his disciples, he said, You who are poor are blessed, because the kingdom of God is yours. Huh. Okay, run back, uh, see, or run ahead to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 25. Familiar verses, I'm sure. You with electronic devices, I, I usually wait for those who are going... Shh, 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 shh. Luke chapter 18, verse 25. It says, For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. I want to kind of give you a better, not necessarily translation, but to kind of bring it to our modern day application. They used camels to get everywhere especially as they're going over deserts, 
and so forth. They needed camels. Horses really weren't their, weren't their thing because camels were more resilient. So sometimes they took a couple of camels to be able to get from one place to the other. So I want you to think of it this, this way. In our day, everybody has the largest SUV they can find if you have at least more than one child. Not everybody, but you get the idea. So how many of you, either you or your children, grandchildren, have an SUV? Okay, got the idea. All right. Think of it this way. Jesus would be telling them in the same verse, Luke chapter 18, verse 25, for it is easier for a SUV to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Hmm. Basically put, this is tough. This is tough for a rich person to get this figured out. And here they are letting, as, as of course they let anybody come into the fellowship of the church at that time, but they're saying, hey, you who has a hard time understanding letting go and letting uh, 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 understanding what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and totally committed to Jesus Christ, you come over here and sit in the head of the table. Uh, but that person who is really doesn't have anything uh, at all except their relationship with Jesus Christ you go sit in the corner, in the floor. He says, that, that's not okay. That's not okay. James calls that thinking, evil thinking. He says, haven't you discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Now, to understand, he's not calling them evil. He just says they're evil, that they're thinking in evil terms. Let's be honest, we make mistakes. Sometimes we get off track, and he's saying, you're just not getting it right now. You need to get back on track. You need to get going the right direction. It's easy to do that because there's a world around us that tells us sometimes we're thinking the wrong way. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 tells us the godly don't need to pick and choose. The godly do not need to pick and choose. Look at verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers. Didn't God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him. Okay, understand at this point, he's not talking about poor or, or rich. He's saying, didn't God tell them, these people who needs to understand and realize that everyone needs to understand who God is and understand the, the importance of having a relationship with, with God? Verse 6, Yet you dishonored that poor man. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Don't they, they d blaspheme the noble name that was pronounced over you at your baptism? Let me just kind of give you an idea where they're at here. Earliest church became equal when they gave everything that they have. Literally, they literally became poor as the widows and orphans, as James talked about in chapter 1. Remember that? We talked about that last week. Run over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'm making you work hard this morning, keeping you awake, I guess. Acts chapter 2. 
they literally, as the first church, when they really did not know what a 501c3 was, when they had not de uh, decided to meet in a building, a true building, that they did not have a plan to meet at a storefront or take over an old church building or meet upstairs at, and call it a church building or put a sign out front, the first church of Jerusalem, the first Christian church. Matter of fact, it was dangerous to do that. What they decided to do is to create the first fellowship, the first real church. And here's what happened. This is the first model church. And by the way, they didn't know what to do. So they became a family. Wow. This was a crazy concept. But this is what they knew to do. Acts chapter 2, verse 43. It's interesting how this starts out. Then fear came over everyone. Huh. And many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now it really is amazing what happens. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all. And anyone, as anyone had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. That was the first church. And it was interesting that they were doing this and they were being family. And it says every day they were adding to their family those who were being saved. It was dangerous. It was not cool. It was weird, but they were doing it anyway. And, but by this time, James was writing these letters. It, the scattered must have evolved into what must have been a, a, a segregated type of church. And go back to James chapter 2. And in verse 5, James gives two rhetorical questions. He says, listen, my dear brothers, didn't God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he was promised to those who love him? Question number one. And he's, James is speaking of the humility that leads to do, total dedication to, get, to Christ. And then he says, yet you dishonored that poor man. Didn't the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Second question. And then, then he says, didn't they blaspheme the noble name that was dis pronounced over you at your baptism? And so basically what he's saying here is, wasn't it the fact that you became this church this family, this fellowship, you, you, the church threw everything together. There was no uh, rich man, no poor man. You all became a family of God. This was the church. But then all of a sudden, there became some segregation. There's the rich guy. There's the poor guy. There's, you started seeing it totally different. You wanted to, to make everybody different. But remember what happened. After you scattered and those who forced you to scatter, it was the Pharisees who had a totally different concept of what Christianity was all about. They're the ones, these rich guys, who really had the purpose of dragging you off 
and putting you in prison. The ones who had actually blasphemed the name of Christ. It says, don't, don't they blaspheme the noble name that was pronounced over you at your baptism? These are the ones that had, had the very purpose of making things miserable, but yet now you want to put them at the head of the table. What makes them better than the person who says, I, no matter what the circumstance, want to come to Christ and have a total relationship with Christ? But yet, you look at them and go, oh, they've got their robes on. Maybe they're going to go ahead and be one of us. They're going to look good. <laughs> Maybe we can convince them now to be like us. But this person over in the corner has got dirty feet, they dirty clothes, but yet they're on fire for Christ. They want, they want what everybody else has. So there's something wrong with that. In verse 8, just like you should not go around picking and choosing this who should be at the head of the table and who should not, don't go around deciding who should receive grace or not. Verse 8 says, Indeed, if you keep the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the entire law, you fail, yet fails in one point, is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you are a lawbreaker. Which one of these uh, um, commandments are you willing to commit and still be in, you know, okay with God? You pick one. The Bible says all of these are commandments that you're not supposed to break, right? Verse 12, speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I'm basically saying this. James uses an example that hits close to home. One cannot decide which commandment to keep to be in compliance with God. One cannot decide who needs grace and who does not. Only God gives grace and he gives it to all. See, our responsibility is just to give a message. Our responsibility is to give it to the message to everyone. It's up to God to decide who needs that message. As far as I'm concerned, Everybody needs the truth about Jesus Christ, and everyone needs to come to know Christ. But, but it comes down to this. We, you and I, have the responsibility to share the truth that everyone needs to come to know Jesus Christ. And the thing is, if we're deciding what person needs to come to know Christ, as James is trying to tell these churches, this guy over here who has the rings, the nice-looking clothes, but not the other guy, then we're messing it all up. We don't go around picking and choosing, right? Which person looks better for our church? Which one makes, makes the image of our church better? Well, it's not about images. It's about the, the, the fact that that person doesn't, we don't want them to go to hell. Listen to this. C.S. Lewis wrote this. When the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade. All right, but what is the good of saying you are on his side then? When you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else comes crashing in. This time it will be God without disguise. 
something so overwhelming that it will strike other or strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen. Whether we realize it before or not, now, today, this moment is our chance to choose the right side. Here, here, here's the deal. <laughs> We do not know when Jesus is coming back. He said he's coming back. Do you believe that Jesus is coming back? Let me just ask you that question. Do you believe that Jesus is coming back? Okay. Glad you believe that. Do you believe that everyone knows that? Now, here's my rhetorical question. Don't answer this, except, you know, don't work, answer it out loud. Why don't they? They don't know because God's people don't have enough passion for all lost people. All people. I won't just not say the word lost people, but for all people. To make sure they know that Jesus is coming back. Regardless of the situation, all people have to make a choice. The choice will not be when Jesus returns. The choice has to be now or before Jesus returns. 